Hey folks, Dave Nodig here, financial futurist at Vetify. Had this great hike with Dr. Phil Perlman. He's the head of the Pearl Institute, which is really focused on maximizing folks' health and wellness the same way a financial advisor is maximizing the wealth and well being of an individual client. There are a lot of parallels here in how. Financial advisors and Phil work with people to think about the future in better ways. It's almost like a universal marshmallow test. We get into some issues of simplicity versus complexity and how those can trip us up both in our health and wellness and in our wealth planning. I think you're going to see a lot of parallels between the work we do in investing and wealth planning and the work we do in our own lives trying to find a happy middle ground on our health and wellness. I found it a really fascinating conversation. Phil's got an infectious enthusiasm and belief in everybody's individual ability to change. I find it really inspiring. I hope you do as well. Cheers. You're working with rich people, right. financial advisors. Right. You come from a psychology background. Right. You've worked in and out of finance. Right. How did you end up in this business of working with that group of people right. about health and wellness? Like right. that seems like a really strange bridge. Well, I spent my career, a large part of my career in finance, in finance, finance media. And uh, so that is my network. Those are my people. And, the, and there's one other thing too, is that I find a lot of the work I do has to do with time perspective. Like, hey, I want to get healthy, but I don't just want to get like 60 day abs. I want to get healthy for the long term. Lifetime health. Lifetime, Lifetime health. Right. And that, if you're an advisor, you're working in a very similar trajectory because you're helping people plan their wealth for the long term. So it's wealth planning. This is health planning. So really, the, the, there's a strong parallel there. And I believe, you know, sort of from a holistic point of view, that those are inseparable. Do you see your audience as being more like an individual executive who's trying to get healthy? Right. Or do you see your audience really being advisors, folks who have that, that, that ability to think forward and then taking some of what they learn with you into their work with their clients? A year ago, I was thinking it's advisors. And now in practice, the people coming to me are entrepreneurs, executives from many different areas, advisors, people who are in finance, uh, but it's become much broader than I had expected. And so I'm just going with that because it feels okay. But you're also not, like you seem very non-doctrinal, if I would put it that way. It's like, you're not a hardcore anything. You're right. not like saying, if you lift weights, perfect happens. Right. If you go keto, perfect happens. Right. If you medicalize or don't medicalize this part of your health, right. good or bad things happen. You seem to be very holistic in your approach of like working with the person in front of them. How did you end up there? I was always skeptical of everything. Always rebellious, always skeptical. It worked against me. It was maladaptive for a long time. Now I'm finding that that is my saving grace as well. Skepticism. Skepticism because I don't, I question everybody and everything. And the thing that I do do now is that I just pluck the practical from anyone at any time. Uh, there's a school of psychotherapy called technical eclecticism <laughs> where they're like, I love that. I've it's never a great heard, I phrase. I love that phrase. And they, and they're technical in that they're, there's an empirical or evidence basis, but they're willing to try anything as long as it does one thing. And that right. is just work. So that whole academic thing, I'm still very suspect of and people getting into these arguments about the minutia of, you know, do I fast till seven o'clock or do I fast till eight o'clock? I mean, you know, do I eat till seven o'clock or do I eat till eight o'clock? Or, you know, like how much zone two? All that stuff is just ridiculous to me. Um, but there are nuggets of practical truths that I just pluck from that stuff. And I call that stupid simplicity. Like, I'm just going to keep it really stupid, but it's a curating process. I'm not ignorant of that stuff. I'm just not getting all caught up in it. That sounds an awful lot like what I hear from what I would call the better financial advisors that I know, which is honestly most of them. Most advisors I talk to are all about simplifying their client's decision space, right? right. They know about options overlay strategies. They know about private farmland REITs, right. but that's not what they spend their time with their client on. They focus on much simpler things. 
do you see those as really very directly parallel, the sort of the craziness of financial academia and the craziness of health and wellness academia? Health and wellness are perfect parallels. And the deeper I get into it, the more, at every turn, that suspicion is supported. Because it doesn't matter whether you, you know, so you could talk about behavioral economics, right? Basic, the, 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 the fundamental component of the first 50 years of behavioral economics is people do not always act within their own self-interest right. when it comes to money. Well, guess what? People do not always act in their own <laughs> self-interest when it comes to health and well-being. And so from that beginning point, everything runs parallel. Future planning. Uh, make it a part of your life. Give something, balancing the present and the future. All of those types of basic philosophical underpinnings are all exactly the same. Oh my God. They're both very squishy subjects in reality. Stupid simplicity when it comes to wealth planning right. is also obvious to me and the way I go about it. So I'm off the, you know, I'm, I'm probably off the deep end when it comes to being practical and non-academic and I don't want to be optimized. I just want it to be simple because a lot of times we get so lost in this forest of optimization that it becomes unmanageable and it becomes uh, so much effort and we wind up giving away other parts of our lives while we're spending all of this energy trying to optimize. So I just want total simplicity. There are three or four low fee ETFs that exist in this world that if you maybe rebalance them once a year and you just keep buying, uh, like Nick like, says. Like Nick says from right, WM, right. Um, that you're going to do amazing. You're going to get 95% of the benefit that you get without having to worry about. And do you think that that same sort of 95% comes from four or five things that applies to health and wellness as well? 110%. So what are those? Like, give, give, me the, give me the bullet points. So I would say move your body every day. You don't have to run marathons. You could just take a walk. If sometimes you want to break a sweat, that's great. <laughs> sometimes you want to do a couple push-ups, that's fantastic. But just move your body. That's one. Number two, clean up your eating, right? Put things into the only body that you ever get. When this thing is used up, you don't get another one. You don't get a mulligan. Put things into that body that fuel it well and that help you build well. So, you know, protein, a lot of protein, more than people su suspect, and not a lot of high processed foods. Number three is rest. If you went out and ran the other day and your leg hurts, don't go out and run, you know? Right. Go for maybe a little walk and just rest and get that good night's sleep. Don't go out and party, you know? Embrace JOMO instead of FOMO, <laughs> where it's a joy of missing out. And then the last one that we never focus on, that we neglect like crazy, that, we ne that health people never talk about is family and relationships and community. Which is 100% what they say is the 1,000% true marker of happiness. Like every study on happiness I've ever read about, whether it comes from a religious perspective, from a, the Harvard study, um, which I know you're familiar with, the 80-year longitudinal study of happiness. There was right. a book published on that recently. I right. think we both read it, should this be part of an advisor's job, coaching individuals about how to have a happy life, not just how to make money? It's a great question. There's a boundary there. And where you draw that boundary, where it occurs naturally, is different for each client that you work with because every person is different. And so having a natural sensitivity to where that line is, is part of the art of being an advisor. And, but at the same time, the word advisor is a great word, right? You are an advisor, you are advising. And you also use the word taboo. Mental wellness, you know, well-being, physical and mental health, and money are both taboos. Right? We don't want to talk about that. We, 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 it's controversial, you know, and uh, we stay away from it. It makes us uncomfortable. Particularly mental health, I would say, in the world that you're working in, that the, what's going on in here is the part we really don't talk about much. Mental, <laughs> spiritual, and physical. Yeah. We don't talk about that either. Well, but there's a, there's a, 
there's an ecosystem around making money off the physical part, right? right. So there's plenty of people who are going to sell you gym memberships and diets and fad diets and right. books on this and Wim Hof. I mean, there's an endless variety right. of things to go spend time, energy, and money on, on the physical wellness side. The how-to is a dime a dozen. The secret sauce is not in the how-to. There's 10,000 books out there. There's 100,000 blog posts out there. There's much more information than you need. Like I was saying before, really just keep it simple. Move your body, eat well, not too often, and get some rest. And, you know, love. Those are the four things. All of that, very, very straightforward. Where, and I, and I think this is part of my secret sauce, just to, you know, brag a little bit, is that who we are, and how we see ourselves when we look at ourselves and who we see when we think, you know, what we think when we think about ourselves. That part, we're not addressing. That part, the average trainer, that part, the average nutritionist, that part, we are not addressing. And so if we want to help somebody become independently well and independently wealthy, they, they parallel then the work that we need to do has to be more than, here's a fish. It has to be more than, hey, here's a how-to. Or here, I'm gonna do it for you. Or here, here's your routine for the day. Go do, you know, this many push-ups and this many that or this many whatever. Uh, it has to be really get in here and help that person begin to see themselves as that person that they aspire to be. Do you, so, I mean, do you feel like being a psychologist is truly your secret sauce in this because you're coming at this from this, this sense of who's the person inside their own brain case to start with? You know, it was always very fascinating to me. How do people change? What are the processes of change? And it was interesting to me, and yet I was not practicing what I was preaching. I was interested in it when it came, it was an academic exercise. It was intellectual. It was intellectual. Yeah. And it was also about other people until I went through my own health journey and until I really got myself together uh, on multiple levels. And that was kind of a trigger for me that it was like, okay, people change. You can be 45, 50, 55. 60 and really change who you are and um, embrace things that are good for you, things that will get you to that place where you want to go. Is that kind of change possible without real tumultuous activity, without, without some catalyst, a heart attack? I hear that one all the time. Right. I had double bypass surgery, changed right. my life. Right? right. I broke a leg falling down the stairs, like right. whatever it is. For me, I got really sick a bunch of years ago. Right. Does it take that, or can you just work with somebody who has the inkling of intent and, and help them get there? The big scare is a great one, but it's not the only one. And uh, people who are contemplating changing, that's happening at many levels. It's happening at this level where it's creeping into consciousness, where they see somebody who's doing something that they would love to do, or there's a milestone like a wedding or a bar mitzvah and they have this experience. So it doesn't have to be a health scare. It doesn't have to be anything. It just has to be this something bubbling up, some discomfort or some kind of contemplation or some kind of thinking or some kind of uh, cognitive dissonance is a, love, a word that we love to use, right, right. term that we love to use. Just something happening there. And that's why they reach out in the first place. Or that's why they maybe do a Google search right. on, you know, getting healthy. And it doesn't have to be 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, I work with people in their 30s also. And as a matter of fact, I find that people in their 30s have a lot more sort of natural elasticity. The longer you're doing the same thing, right? Though I mean, it, we call it a rut for a reason, right? right? Like a wheel going through a track in the ground, right? It's very hard to get out of there, and it doesn't definitely seems like habits that I've been doing my entire life are the ones that are going to be the hardest to break. Stuff I picked up a couple of years ago, I can get over. 
You know, there's a way to elegantly reframe things. And I think of it as judo, because with judo, and I'm no expert in the martial arts, but I do understand this one aspect of it, is that we use the weight, instead of using force and our own body weight, we use the weight and balance, uh, 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 we use our balance and the weight of our opponent against them. So if somebody lunges at me, I may move backwards, but then use their, that weight. So reframing can be unbelievably powerful. And so if somebody has been very successful in their life, and they've done things by rolling up their sleeves and grit and uh, uh, brute force, and yet, they're, and that's been in this external world of business, finance, whatever, and they're having a hard time do, using that same approach for something that's more internal, their own well-being, their own how they feel, their own uh, metabolic health, their own uh, psychological wellness and contentment or happiness, then maybe that's, they have data already. Right. So I might say to them, well, you know, you've been trying it this way and it hasn't been working. So that's the data. If you're the scientist, if you're the, if you're the chief scientist of uh, your own lifetime experiment and you're the sole subject, so you're the scientist and the subject of this continuous scientific experiment that is your life, then if you have this data that you've been trying to do something and it hasn't worked, you have that data, right? you know? So let's maybe try something else, <laughs> you know? Let's maybe, right. instead of using, you know, the, the lunge, let's try the judo and go the other way and make it maybe not being optimized, maybe not being so effortful all the time, maybe not trying to be perfect. When you're working with somebody who is sort of that type A personality, right. who's optimized everything in their life, particularly in the finance world, like right. optimize is not a bad word in right. finance. And right. A lot of money gets spent optimizing right. portfolios and right. trading strategies right. and financial advisory practices. Right. How does it land when you tell somebody, hey, you know what? We're going to de-optimize the approach here and focus on a couple of very simple things. And we know we're only going to be 90% optimal but you're going to actually get the 90%. Does that land or is that a hard conversation? Because that runs counter to how a lot of us have built our lives in finance. Everybody's different. And part of what I do is just find the opening on a human level with that person. Just like a financial advisor does. Just like a financial yeah. advisor does. I mean, there's a difference between talking about empathy and being empathic. And so if you're going and taking a course and they're saying, okay, today we're going to talk about empathy and how you do empathy. You don't really do empathy. You be empathy. <laughs> right. You know, you be empathic. Right. It's not a checklist. It's yeah. not a che There's no checklist for empathy. Empathy is just really connecting with that other person and feeling what they're going through. And, and when you do that, um, you connect with them and they connect with you and they feel heard. And every person has this growth instinct in them. Everybody wants to develop. Everybody wants to get better. Everybody wants to be, to, 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 to feel right and to do right and to prepare and to all of these positive trajectory things. We all want that. That is human and natural. And so when we connect with people, that is an inroad. You, you used a phrase when we were hiking um, that really stuck with me as you talked about the experience of like when you're first meeting with somebody and you realize what they need is for you to know that you got them, like right. you've got their back, right. Right? You're, you're on their team, you're right. on team Bob, team right. Janet, whatever right. it is. Right. Um, again, that resonated really deeply with the conversations I've had with good financial advisors, right. which is that a lot of times the customer, the client is walking in and it's not that they don't know what to do. They know right. that they're supposed to put the money in the retirement account and all. It's not that they need a trust plan. Right. It's they need to know somebody's got them. Right. I'm going to look right in the camera and say this. Pre, 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 uh, prerequisite here. You really have to got them. <laughs> I just need to say that. You can't. You can't pretend. You can't fake that you got them. You right. can't tell them. I, I can't say, listen, dude, I got you. I'm your guy. I'm yeah, your you guy. Do, yeah. And you can't, that can't be a lie. Right. You have to, that ha, you, you have to be, that has to be real because you're going to get, the, 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 there's tests down the road to come. That's the easy, <laughs> right. you know, that, that's just the, the entrance. That's right. not the trail. Well, like right? you say about marriage, I do is the easiest two words you're ever going to say I do is so easy. The easiest it's two words two syllables, three letters. 
It's very simple, the but then part. the path yeah. is really the, the thing. The actual doing is the hard part. But yes, if that person feels like, wow, this person's got me. Because we are social animals by nature. From the time we are infants, looking into our primary caregiver's eyes and seeing that that person's got us. Uh, that fundamental relationship is repeated over and over and over again forever in our lives from the time we're born uh, to the time we pass. And so, yes, if you got them and you let them know that, that is a fundamental relational you know, you could call it mentorship, you could call it teaching, you can call it parenting, you can call it whatever you call it, training, you know, a trainer. Uh, that is a very, that is the, uh, that is the, uh, those are the threads that you build. You know, that's the glue that holds it together. What you want to do is have them, but also foster that, hey, you can do this, you know. You can, you, you, you got this. I believe in you. Yeah. You, yeah. you got this. It, 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 it really moves from, from, from I got you to you got this. That's a path, you know. I never really thought about that before, but it's very, happens every single time. And, and it happens in parenting. It happens in mentorship. It happens in teaching. It happens in the best uh, boss-employee relationships. It happens in all those. That's a very fundamental relational human thing. Right. I don't think I have a single thing I can do better than end of that one. That was okay. great. Okay, great, dude, dude. Thank you so much for doing this. Dude, thank you for bringing me here. This right. Was, By was, the way, we're in fun. Mohong. Isn't this fun, <laughs> dude? This is incredible. We went on a great hike today, <laughs> and now we're just like in the middle of nowhere, having this conversation. Thank this you. Is, well, dude. no, thank you for coming Amazing. outside with me because like, yeah. I've decided I never want to do this in an office again. <laughs>